right, beware of dogma. It wants a fight, beware of dogma. It will ignite a holy war by itself. What's your name and what's your religious belief? Dan Barker, atheist. Very good. And have you always been an atheist? No, I was raised a believer. My family was true believers, door-to-door -door preachers, singing in the choir, preaching. My dad went to Bible school. We had Saturday morning Bible classes for the neighborhood children to convert them to Jesus. So, uh, and then I went, I, I became a preacher myself for years, so. What denomination, what would you call, what type of uh, um, Christianity did you grow up in? Well, my family's Christianity was eclectic. We started out in the Christian church when my dad was young, when, when I was a little boy. But my parents were church hoppers for a long time because they couldn't find a church that was spiritual enough for them. So we tried this for a while. We were in the Church of the Nazarene for a while. We were at a Baptist church for a while. We tried different churches until finally we settled on the charismatic movement. There was an Assembly of God church in California that became a charismatic church, which are these churches that sort of, sort of break off from their main denomination. And charismatics are a kind of uh, Pentecostalism light. You speak in tongues, you have faith healing, you have the gifts of the Spirit, all of that. And so in the meetings, it wasn't just listening to a lecture about morality. When we went to church, we were evangelical, Bible-believing, conservative, fundamentalist, but we were also in church to be with God and feel His presence and speak to Him and feel the angels and then cry in the Spirit and all of that. We weren't just there to learn. We were there to live and experience God. That, that was my whole upbringing. And so uh, you are saying, mentioning speaking tongues. Did you have that experience yourself? I did speak in tongues and I still can as an atheist, which is kind of freaky. I can go back into that mode and speak in tongues and reproduce all those feelings and it feels pretty good. Speaking in tongues, for those who do it, we must release some chemicals in the brain or it, it makes you feel peaceful, joyful, integrated with God. You feel this kind of, at least I felt this kind of parent figure up here telling me everything's fine and the world is good. You know what I mean? There was just this, maybe you don't, but if you've, if you've never done it, you can't knock it because speaking in tongues and other forms of mysticism are very real, powerful experiences inside the brain. So I guess now you would say it's uh, being created by your brain, but I guess at the time you believed that it was coming through you from the spirit. Yeah, if you're a believer and you are having a mystical experience, which isn't that uncommon, I think maybe half the population on the distribution curve half of us are kind of over here susceptible to mystical experiences. If you believe in God or whatever your religion is and you're having that experience, then it's affirming. It's like proof that your beliefs are real. And at the time, I was convinced they pointed outside of nature that was something coming from above. Now I realize we can have those experiences, but they're just coming from your brain. They're an internal. They don't necessarily point to anything outside of the natural world. Right. And that is interesting because you would think that having become an atheist, uh, you wouldn't be able to speak in tongues once you gave up your belief in God, if that were the, the source of it. Yeah, you would think so. And I thought I was kind of weird for a while when I was a brand new baby atheist and I could still go back and do that. Maybe once a year I'll go back and try that. But, uh, you know, others might say the same thing about singing in a church choir. Uh, a, a lifelong atheist, David Randolph, was a conductor at Carnegie Hall. He loved Handel's Messiah. He would perform it. He had the world record for performing Handel's Messiah about, He shall reign forever and ever. And he didn't believe a word of it, but he got tears in his eyes when he performed the religious music because it's really a human expression. It's an artistic human expression. And many of us uh, are just, we just like that. Our brains are, we just enjoy. There's a lot of atheists who don't. They don't know what the heck we're talking about. But there's a lot of us over here who still, we don't believe, we know there's no God, we know there's no spirit world, and yet the, the human expression is an amazing, it's kind of like, you don't have to be a Muslim to appreciate Islamic architecture. You can look at it and go, 
Wow, that's amazing. When Muslims look at that, they're thinking something different. But when a non-Muslim looks at it, they're just thinking, what a gorgeous human expression of yearning and, and hope and whatever that is that we're trying to do as human beings. Now, when you were a Christian, I, I assume you, that the fundamentalist strain you were in, you didn't believe in, you believed literally everything in the Bible, the Adam and Eve story, uh, you didn't believe in evolution or any of that. Um, did you have any, any doubts uh, early on when you were growing up or even um, as an evangelical? When I was young, I had no doubts. When I was a beginning preacher, for at least 10 to 15 years, I had no doubts at all. Fundamentalist, evangel evangelical fundamentalist, Bible-believing Christians like I was, we know there's some metaphor in the Bible. Everybody knows that. When Jesus said, I am the door, you don't look for hinges. I mean, we know that there was, when he said he was the Lamb of God, you don't, cut off the wool of Jesus, right? We know there is metaphor. We, even the most strict, literalist Bible believer knows there's figures of speech in the Bible. But the difference, I think, is where do you draw the line? Where do you say this is metaphorical and this isn't? And for most Bible believers like my family, if there's no explicit reference to it being a parable or metaphorical, then we take it at face value. So Adam and Eve were not presented as a parable. They were presented as real historical people. Otherwise, God is a liar, and God cannot be a liar. So that's the kind of believers we were. We acknowledge metaphor, but we realize that most of the Bible is truly, literally factual. If I'd known this for more than three or four years, I don't know how I would deal with this. I might overload and my head would explode in a figurative way, like, you know, I wouldn't be able to deal with it. I'd go Looney Tune or whatever. Not that, you know, but the Lord's kept my head on level. I have no doubts, 100%. Same here, 100%. In my heart of hearts, in my truth, I believe that tomorrow is the last day. You know, I, I traveled with the, the Harold Camping Group uh, in their motorhomes for the last three days of the, of the world filming them. And they were absolutely certain the end of the world was coming, you know, the next day. Um, is this a belief that you held as far as the end, end times being near when you were a Christian? We did believe the end of the world was imminent. It was right around the corner, like a thief in the night. No man knows the hour. And I remember thinking as a, a young believer in the family and then later how lucky I was that I was born not only in the right religion, in the right family, in the right country, but also in the right time of history because the world was going to end any minute and I got to be a soldier in the army of Christ bringing people in at that last second. It was a very exciting feeling and there's some kind of an arrogance in the mind of not all but many Christians and it's always been even since the day of Jesus who said there will be some disciples who won't die before the end comes and Paul who said it would be quick. Uh, the Millerites in the 1830s and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1914 or 1925 and so on, and then Harold Camping and his group, we were like that. We thought it could be tonight. And that's a powerful evangelical tool to go up to somebody and say, you know, Jesus might return tonight, and if he does, will you be ready? And a lot of people go, oh. and so that's, that's a good way to convert, to be a missionary. It's almost a, a conversion through fear tactic when yeah. I saw it myself personally. It is. It's a fear, fear tactic. Do I want to go to hell? Is this the end? Have I been complacent and ignoring all this time and then it's going to be too late and then I'm going to regret that I didn't give my life to Jesus when I had a chance? So uh, there will be a time. Jesus is love, but after that point, forget it. You're going to burn. You don't want to wait to see that it's going to happen and then do something because then it's for sure going to be too late. And I guess it, it changes your whole focus where you're thinking very short term rather than thinking of your whole life or looking to preserve the environment for future generations and it's a whole different way I guess of perceiving the world. That's true. There was a hymn we used to sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, somewhere beyond the blue. So, um, uh, you know, like James Watts under Reagan considered the environment as just sort of a doormat for a future life. It doesn't matter what we do in this world. And that's how I thought the world's going to end. I don't need to 
get educated. I didn't have to go to college. I didn't have to plan for the future. Even when Jesus said in the Bible, take no thought for the morrow. Right now, this is what we had to do. So uh, it is short-sighted and it's reckless. We didn't plan. We didn't have savings. We didn't, we didn't have... We lived by faith for eight years. I and my new wife and little kid, we were driving around the country preaching the end of the world and the gospel and no health insurance, no, you know, our furniture was in storage. We were just driving around from church to church trying to get one more soul into the kingdom before the world ended. And, um, you know, I regret that. I suppose I would have done it the same way, but uh, that's the mindset that a lot, not all, it's the mindset that a lot of believers have. So I am curious about why do you think that was such an attractive thing to you and to so many people, this idea of the end of the world? I mean, even people who aren't religious are now waiting for 2012 and these sorts of things. It seems to be such a universal yearning for humans. There is that yearning. I don't know if it's universal, but I think there's a subset in many religions, depending on your psychology. But you feel special. You feel like you know something. You feel like you're living in a special time. You feel like you get to be called to be on the front line of this cause, that, you, uh, that your life might not have as much meaning as you would like it to, but this gives your life really special meaning. We're moving on. Maybe, maybe it's the great immigrant story. We're going to move on from this country that we live in that isn't quite right and we want to get out of here, so let's move on to a paradise somewhere else. Maybe European immigrants to the U.S. felt something like that. We're moving. We're going. A utopian dream. <clears throat> yeah, something. I've, but even, even if you don't have those feelings, as a believer, it's true. Regardless of whether you like it or want it or not, if it's true, if there is going to be a judgment day, if the Bible is right, then we better knuckle down and, and get busy about it, get serious about this issue. The world's going to end in our eternal destinies and our soul is much more important than what you major in in college. Or, uh, I think I want to be an architect so I can build buildings. But those buildings aren't going to last forever. They're going to fall apart, right? But your eternal destiny, what's more important than someone's eternal destiny? So there's this psychological, uh, it's not an aha, it's kind of a, it's almost an arrogance. I get to be a part of the front line of this special message to the world. The chosen people and all. Yeah, and it, and it gives you meaning. We pretended we were humble servants. I'm a humble servant of Jesus. I'm just following the Lord. But you better get along with us or you're going to burn. You know? So it's this double feeling that you have. You, you pretend to be humble, but you're really arrogant because I've been chosen by the creator of the cosmos to be one of his spokespeople. So, I mean, is that humility or what is that? She says, uh, Dad, I wanted to apologize. And I said, oh, what for? She says, Dad, I've been very selfish. And I said, I said, what do you mean? I don't understand. She said, Dad, you know, when I was making you feel bad that you weren't around on the weekends and you were always out doing, you know, passing out tracks and warning people. I was selfish, Dad. I wanted you to spend time with me. And now that I understand why you're doing this, I wanted to say I'm sorry. I almost broke into tears after she said this to me. I do have a new earth. It's just what, just what the doctor would order. <laughs> At the time when you were a Christian, and if somebody were to have asked you, had, did Joshua do the moral thing in killing men, women, and children of, of whole villages of the Canaanites because God ordered this, or Abraham being ordered to kill his own son? I mean, at that time, would you have said that that was moral? And would you have answered that question of, would you have done such a thing in the positive? If you had asked me back then if it was moral, I wouldn't have known what the word moral meant. I would have said it was the right thing to do because it's godly. The question of morality, I would have thought was some kind of a human question. And whether it's, whether it's morally permissible is something for philosophy class. But if it's godly, if it's holy, no matter what it is, even if we humans don't like it, 
it's the right thing to do because God's saying to do it. Uh, uh, for example, nobody thinks we should take a needle and poke it into a baby unless that baby needs a life-saving injection. Then we create the harm, we cause the pain, we make the baby cry, and the baby doesn't know what the heck's happening. Why are you poking me with a needle? I don't like this. Stop doing that. So believers like I was would think, we are the baby. We don't understand the universe. But the father figure up there does know that for our own good, the needle has to be poked. This damage has to be done. What we think is a horrible thing that we don't like. And we admit we don't like it. We don't think we should kill people. We don't think human beings should have the authority to commit genocide. But because God is bigger and knows everything, the godly thing to do is do what God says. Because what if we disobey? What if, what if the baby gets its way and the needle is not poked into the baby? Then the baby is going to suffer an even worse fate. So that's how I was thinking. It was kind of a rationalizing of uh, shifting the responsibility for my actions off of my own human moral judgment, which could be faulty or could be wrong taking that out of the equation and not even asking if it's moral, but asking if it's the right godly thing to do. In that case, I would say, yes, God should have done it, and His servants were justified in following the orders to do what the Father figure told them to do. So it's a transference of basically that, uh, you know, that authority to decide what's right and wrong. That's right. For example, when I was a teenager, um, if I had been drafted, and I wasn't drafted into Vietnam because I got a ministerial exemption, but if I had been drafted, I remember thinking in my mind, I don't want to pull a trigger and shoot people. I don't think I should do that. But it's not me pulling that trigger. It's Uncle Sam pulling the trigger. It's not me deciding who lives or dies. It's my country deciding. And so it's not really my fault. I'm just, doing, I'm just following orders, doing what God told me. That's a dangerous mentality. I think when you get into your mid-20s and 30s, you start thinking, wait a minute, I'm not... You know, it's easy to draft young people. And I think this whole mentality of godliness is a kind of delayed moral development. It's kind of like, I'm not going to think for myself. So, um, I, would have said, I would have said the genocides in the Bible were the right thing to do, regardless of whether it was moral. I might have even said, it's immoral. It's wrong by human standing, but we don't judge by human standards. We let God judge by His higher wisdom. And so I guess you would have said if God ordered you to do the same thing to your own children or anything, you would follow those orders. Exactly. There's the danger of faith. That's the danger of obedience. That if I was convinced that God had told me to do this, then it wasn't me doing it. Hey, don't blame me. It's the Father. And if there's a problem with what I'm doing, it's His fault. And do you really want to get in trouble? With the big daddy, he's the one making these decisions. Do you really want to disobey your military superiors when they tell you to take a military action? Do you want to get in that kind of trouble? Fortunately, there are some people who say, yes, I do. There are some people who obey military, disobey military orders, and you and I might call them heroes, right? Because who knows if the sergeant or who knows if the generals are actually doing the right thing. But uh, there's this sort of childish mentality that happens in many religions and with some young people who are in the military that I'm going to show what a good person I am and follow the orders and maybe earn the medals and earn heaven uh, and that's how I fit into this world. I don't have to think for myself. And so what would you say now? Is there, is there anybody who could order you to kill your own child that you would obey? Yeah, there, there, there's no way that would happen. I mean, I suppose theoretically there's a .00001 probability that someone could make a case. But it would have to be a rational case, right? There might be some weird, impossible to imagine situation where if I don't do it, the whole human race is going to die, so maybe I should kill my own. I mean, there might be something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> but it would go against our human nature, our altruistic, empathetic, caring nature that we have in our basic rational idea of respect for life. So, um, so no, it's like in Julia Sweeney's play, if you've seen it. Uh, if, if God tells you to kill your own son, isn't the proper answer, no, no, I will not kill my own son? So many of us atheists and agnostics think we're better than God. We're to the place where if you created a hell, then you go to hell. You're the one who's immoral. You're the one who's not caring about human life. You're the one who's disregarding 
morality. <clears throat> and I think there's the distinction. There's a difference between morality and godliness. Godliness may be tremendously immoral, and we have to choose. Do you want to be a moral person? In which case, you can't be a godly person. If you're a moral person, you will denounce God for his actions. He's my savior. You follow him blindly. Absolutely, without question, always. He asked um, Abraham to take his son up to the top of the mountain to slay him in obedience to God, just to be obedient. And do you think that Abraham was doing the right thing? Well, being obedient to God, absolutely. And if you, God tells you, because you're talking about the God that can take your very breath away, you do what you're told. If you were back in Joshua's time, mm -hmm. and God gave you that order, would you follow it? I would hope so. I, I, I would. I would like to think that I would be strong enough to do that. And I would be afraid not to. Because, and it is hard. Sometimes God asks us to do nothing like that. <laughs> Thank goodness. But sometimes in our own lives, He asks us to make hard decisions. And we have to, at the end of the day, you have to say, am I going to please man or am I going to please God? How did that happen that you changed? What, what was the first crack in your, in, your, in your true faith? I was a true believer and never imagined changing. And what happened was after my musicals were published, and Christian denominations that were different from mine were performing them. I was invited to other churches, and I learned there's not one Christianity. There's thousands of little Christianities. There may be as many Christianities as there are Christians. And what happened was I didn't go from fundamentalist Christian overnight to atheist. That was impossible. I moved little by little across this continuum from the fundamentalists more toward a moderate. It took about four or five years. And some of the early questions I had were those questions about the Bible. What is metaphor? What is literal? For example, I met Christians who didn't think Adam and Eve were historical, and I was shocked at first. But they explained to me that, well, the prodigal son wasn't historical. It was just a parable that wasn't true to illustrate a moral tale. So the early Israelites made a parable about the human race and the fall and sin and Adam and Eve were just a parable. They weren't really real people and now with what we know about evolution there couldn't have been an Adam and Eve. So I remember some of those early questions and what happened was the Bible became less and less literal and more and more metaphorical and it just kept gradually moving as I talked to more pastors. I talked to liberal pastors and Eventually that line kept going up and up and so suddenly it wasn't just the prodigal son and it wasn't just Adam and Eve, this big father figure in the Bible. That character is also a metaphor. God himself is just a big human figure of speech. And so the line popped up here and I realized, well, that's atheism. That's what that is. The whole thing is just a human expression to try to give meaning. And, but it was painful. It, was a, it took four or five years of intellectually thinking it through and gradually, you know, I was thinking I'm becoming a more mature Christian. I'm becoming a more sophisticated, more subtle. I don't have to be so hard-nosed like the fundamentalists. I can be a more, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of Christians who also diss the fundamentalists. Those crazy literalists, they're, they're not understanding the true message of the Bible in a more sophisticated way. So I went through that whole process and tasted pretty much that whole continuum of Christianity until I got out at the end and I dumped out the bathwater and I said, hey, there's no baby there. It's just all one huge figure of speech. I do find that interesting because when, when I interviewed uh, uh, James Dunn, for example, who had, uh, uh, you know, he's along that continuum, he's just not made that final step and the same with um, Reverend Barry Lind when I've interviewed him. Yeah. You know, they uh, are, are very questioning, doubtful people and they aren't certain about anything. They, they won't say they're 100% certain uh, even that Jesus rose from the dead or that heaven exists. Yeah. And so it is fascinating. They've come along that continuum as well and then they just kind of stopped at a certain point. And I find that many people, I grew up Catholic and we didn't have the Adam and Eve story but <coughs> then we were pretty literal on everything else and mm -hmm. so it is interesting. Well, those liberal believers are very smart, and they're very caring, and they're very good people. And at least we atheists are happy that they are over here and not over there. I mean, that's an immense improvement for the world. And 
we're not trying to convince them to make that final leap, but some of us have made that leap. Right. And, and it's fascinating because they, maybe because of the fact that they are not as literal and they have some doubt, uh, they're actually for things like separation of church and state and, 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 and those sorts of, yeah. so, sorts of issues. So. Yeah, well, people should be judged by their actions. Who cares what they believe? Even literalists, who cares? If they want to stand on their heads and pray in tongues to Mother Goose, why do we care? That's not important. We judge people, and even the Bible says that. You shall know them by their fruits. So the, most, of these, most Christians, even fundamentalists, mo, especially moderate and more liberal Christians, they're good people. There really are good people, and many of them are very smart and caring. So what we atheists should care about is how they live their lives. We shouldn't be judging them. How can you be so stupid to still believe in a God? That's, that's irrelevant. How do you treat other people? Do you work for civil rights? Do you work for gay marriage? Do you work for separation of church and state? Let's march in the same marches and, um, and get along in this world. It seems, though, that uh, you almost have to have a little bit of doubt about the certainty of what the Bible or God wants you to, to be that generous to other people's beliefs. Uh, at least the people that I found who are fighting against gay rights and interviewed our state representative who was the one who um, started this uh, amendment uh, one fight, you know, to, and he on camera, you know, said that he would bring back the anti-sodomy laws to lock hmm. up homosexuals. He is certain, he is absolutely certain, the literalness of the Bible, and I think that precludes him being generous to other people's yeah. uh, doubts or beliefs. That, I think that's true. The fundamentalists, or whatever you want to call it, the extreme conservatives, have this certainty. They have what I used to have. I call it binary brains. It's either, the Bible says it should be cold or hot, because if it's lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. So a fundamentalist in any religion is an absolutistic binary brain where there's no middle. There can't be. So it's either right or wrong, yes or no, black or white. Um, and so in the minds of these fundamentalists who are absolutely certain, they can't admit any possible gray area because that would mean God is half holy. God is half right. I think with the liberals, I don't know if it's so much doubt that they have as it is tolerance. Many of the liberals probably think these other believers are wrong, but let's allow that. Whereas the fundamentalists don't want to allow that. It's heaven or hell. You choose. God is, God is perfect, and if holiness is perfect, there's no gray area holiness within the world. You have to choose. And I think that betrays uh, an insecurity in their thinking, that their own minds have to be so locked, binary, hard, that they can't consider alternatives. It's an arrogance. I am right, and I'm always right, and my way of thinking is the right way. After centuries of religious fights and religious warfare, I'm the guy that's going to tell the world what the Bible actually means. That's, a, that's not a humble servant of anybody. That's arrogant. And it's interesting hearing you say that uh, you know, there was uh, a lot of fear in your uh, uh, coming to this conclusion. Um, I imagine your family were all fundamentalist as well as your wife and children and all your friends and colleagues. Um, how, how did you deal with letting them know that you'd gone through this change? I sent out a letter in January of 84 to everybody. I thought the simplest thing would be just to put it on the table, a one-page letter, which I reproduce in my book, Godless, that just says I'm, I'm not a believer anymore. And. Um, some of those Christian friends back then responded very nicely, and we're still friends today. It was wonderful to, to discover that we were really friends. Real friendship is an admiration for each other as people. And some of them today, we still like each other, we get along, we, we don't meet as much as we would like to. But some of the others responded in this horrible, ugly way. It was surprising and painful to discover, I guess we really weren't friends in the first place if we couldn't weather something like that. If the friendship was conditional, then is that a friendship? And then did you really lose anything at all? My Christian marriage fell apart largely because of this issue. She viewed herself as a minister's wife. She later remarried a Baptist minister. So you could see that in her mind there were some lines that could not be crossed. To her credit, she did try to bend and try to learn, but she had some lines that could not be crossed. And so the marriage ended, and that's always painful. 
But uh, it was good in the beginning when we agreed with each other, and we, we have four great children from that marriage. So it wasn't like it was a bad marriage, but at the end, people grow, people change. And what happens when one changes and one doesn't? There's a, a minister um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, who um, his wife pretty much went through the process the same time he did, and they're very fortunate. They both realized at the same time, he left the ministry, and she's glad he did. So that didn't happen with me. You never know what's going to happen. But uh, my mom and dad were shocked at first. They later both became atheists, which was really fun. Yeah. My mom told a reporter, it's great being an atheist. I don't have to hate anymore. My brother Daryl was always kind of a lousy Christian anyway, he admits. And he became a humanist and an atheist as well, which was really surprising. I wasn't trying to preach at my family. Uh, the other boy, Tom, the brother, the middle brother, is still a born-again Christian and a great guy, a retired high school principal. And he's, he's we, we call him the white sheep of the family. He's just never understood what happened. He probably thinks the devil has seduced us or and he's praying for us. And, and that's fine. He's sincere. Um, we, and how about your children? Do you get to talk to them? Have they uh, still remained Christians? Or? Yeah, my, the children from the Christian marriage, um, Becky and Christy and Andrea and Danny, are, they're really smart and sweet and good people. They have kids of their own now. And uh, I don't think religion is that important. I think maybe, I don't know, we don't talk about it too much, but maybe, maybe Becky and Christy have some beliefs, which is fine, because we judge them by their actions, not their beliefs. And I think Danny calls himself agnostic. And Andrea came to the Reason Rally. Andrea is an atheist, a non-believer, a humanist, who really cares about human rights. And she's so mad at how the church treats gays, for example, and that. So uh, Andrea not only got to go to the Reason Rally, the first time she went to any atheist event, it was her first time in D.C. And she was like waking up in the world. This is, the world is a great place to be. So um, your kids are always your kids. And if you have a loving family, then the differences shouldn't matter that much. I know that uh, myself, when I... Um, uh, I was brought up very strictly Catholic in, in a working class neighborhood in Chicago and uh, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school with the Jesuits. I did not know anybody who, who didn't believe. And um, I, when I did come to the conclusion myself in high school just from reading um, that this was not true, this was made up, I felt very isolated and alone. It wasn't until I went to art school on a scholarship that I met anybody else who didn't believe. <laughs> And uh, I guess for you, had you, had you met people who were atheists uh, before your conversion? Did they convert you, or when was it that you, you finally met uh, a true atheist? I changed my mind purely intellectually and all by myself. We all know atheists, but we just didn't know it. So at the time that I became an atheist, I may as well have been the only one in the world, like you, you know. Um, and it didn't matter. I wasn't thinking to join a club. I didn't see some atheist evangelist on TV convince me to jump on a bandwagon. Come on, get with the rest of us because it's great. Atheism is fun. I didn't even think it was that great or fun. I didn't knowingly have any acquaintance with any other atheist in the world. I knew theoretically that they must be out there. But I think that's kind of good because it shows that our conclusions belong to us. It wasn't like somebody convinced me. It wasn't that I was reading any atheist writers. Later I did. Most of the work that I did was reading Christian writers. Most of the, most of the scholarship that discredits Christianity comes from within Christianity. So you don't have to go outside of your religion to tear your religion apart. So, um, and that's true with Islam, too. There's a lot of Islamic scholarship. And, of course, Judaism. You know, there's, in America, most Jews are atheists. So when I became in 1984, it was actually 1983 when I knew it, when I became this brand new baby atheist, I, I was all by myself. It was all alone. And it was kind of scary, but kind of fun. Um, maybe like a, a lone rock climber or a skydiver or something. You're doing something exciting, but you're all by yourself doing it. Uh, it was only later, nine months later, that I knowingly met another atheist. And that was on the Oprah Winfrey Show, where I met Annie Laurie whom I later married, um, and we have a videotape of the day we met, which is pretty cool. 
uh, and her mom, Anne, and another woman. And it, that was also the first time I publicly spoke about my atheism. So there was all this stuff going on. The first time I had ever put those words into sentences in front of an audience. And it was also the first time I ever spoke before a hostile audience, which I loved. I thought that was great. Uh, so how did the audience uh, react? Oprah had packed that audience with Bible thumpers. It was great TV. It really was interesting, you know. And so they were holding their big fat Bibles and yelling at us. And one woman pointed at Annie Lloyd says, You are a witch! And Annie Lloyd says, Oh yeah, you want to burn me at the stake? Is that what you're saying? It was pretty, it was pretty fascinating. And uh, I'm the kind of person that was energized. I had always spoken before appreciative audiences as a minister. And now I was actually saying something that was making a difference. It felt like, wow, I could do this. This is great. And I've been doing it ever since. Folks, please welcome the co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and co-hosts of Free Thought Radio, Annie Laurie Gaylor and Dan Barker. Hello, all you glorious, goddamned infidels. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylord. And I'm Dan Barker, and we are co presidents of the Freedom from Religion Foundation and co hosts of Free Thought Radio. What was the, uh, the impetus to starting uh, the Clergy Project? The Clergy Project came together almost miraculously from a number of independent threads. My part in it was that for many years I have met other clergy like myself and have 25 to 30 friends that we all kind of just informally share our stories. And um, Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, and his colleague Linda Lascola, who's a researcher, did a study in 2010 about preachers who are not believers. And I was able to funnel a few of my names to them, including some active clergy that I hear from, because they read Godless and they're going through the same process now that I and our other former clergy were going through. And so it's kind of like they were reaching out to us, and how, what's going to happen, how do I tell my family, how do I get a job, what books did you read, and it's just sort of an informal friendship of things happening. So uh, the Dennett La Scola study came out, and about the same time, Richard Dawkins had also been talking about the fact that, especially in Europe, but all over the world, there are a lot of clergy who are in the pulpit who don't believe. And he and I had a brief talk in uh, Copenhagen a couple years ago about what could we do. And he, Dennett um, and Richard Dawkins kind of casually said, well, why don't we start something like a scholarship to help retrain the clergy? And, uh, and I kind of joked, we could maybe call it Save a Preacher or Redeem the Clergy or something, you know, and um, to actually help, you know. And so all of these ideas sort of came together. Linda Lascola and Robin Cornwell, Elizabeth Cornwell, who's the president or director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, and I, we met in Washington, D.C. at the Museum of the American Indian, which was kind of fun to be there. And we thought, why don't we start something. It wasn't even called the Clergy Project. Richard Dawkins Foundation put up the money, and it was a lot of money, to develop this secret online forum that we are now calling the Clergy Project. And uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation contributed some resources and then a lot of time, because it was a lot of volunteer work, and then a whole bunch of people just volunteered, mostly ex-clergy like myself and others, to make this thing work. And it's amazing. We started in March of uh, 2011 with about 50. Uh, about 15 of those were active clergy. And uh, then in October of 2011, we went public with this public page, theclergyproject.org, where people can then make applications to join. And after they are carefully screened, then we let them into this private forum. Today, there's about 220 just a little more than a year later, and we're getting applications all the time, and the screening process is getting, it's getting cumbersome because so many are coming in, and there's only seven of us now. So we're looking for more screeners to try to, because we want to make sure they're legit, they're not trying to crash the thing, they really are 
some kind of formal clergy, ordained or whatever, or licensed, and they are truly non-supernatural. They have truly abandoned complete supernatural beliefs. And they, uh, then we invite them into the forum, and then the forum has all this great dialogue going on, on different levels. There's a corner for the liberals, there's a corner for the fundamentalists and Pentecostals, uh, like Jerry DeWitt, who was, who was one of, I think Jerry DeWitt was the first actual graduate from the clergy, we call them graduates. They were in the pulpit and then they got out while they were in the project. Uh, and uh, music, uh, philosophy, uh, practical career matters, how did you find a job, how can I, some of it is mental health, there's some depression, some of it is marital counseling, what can I, how do I, how does my marriage stay together, all of these issues that are especially poignant to clergy, male or female clergy, who are in the pulpit and want to get out, so. I guess it is a moral dilemma because, you know, it's not just your decision um, to change your belief. I mean, it has implications for your family, for your children. They may be in school and, and uh, you know, medical expenses, insurance, all of this stuff, I guess, could be threatened uh, by your yeah. coming out. Yeah. Well, because being a minister isn't just a job you're doing, like being a plumber or, you know, being a CPA, it's a, you know, that you might love or not. It's not just what you do, it's who you are. I was a reverend. I was respected in the community. When I spoke, people listened. It was like I had a spe special kind of, th there's almost a special level of people in the country called the clergy that uh, are, uh, it's a hierarchical thing. And then when you lose that, you're no longer here, you're, you're just a guy. You're just a person. And so there's all of that that goes along with it. And then, who's going to hire somebody with a divinity degree in today's economy? That's a big struggle. There's a couple people in the clergy project who, for more than two years, have been atheists, and they can't find an escape strategy. They can't find a way out. They want to. They want to be honest. These, these people want to tell their congregations. They want to be people of integrity, but they can't yet because health insurance. One of them has a disabled wife whose condition is a pre-existing condition, and if he tried to get another job, he knows that she would not be covered. So he has to keep going through the motions because he loves his family. It's not that he wants to be a hypocrite. It's not that he wants to stay in the church and rake up money. Being He wants to get out, but he's stuck. And there's a lot of stories like that. And so the clergy project right now is just a common community where we're helping each other feel welcome. Eventually we hope to become an organization where we can actually raise funds to materially make a difference. That's wonderful. And how did you do that? How, how did you bridge the gap between the two? I mean, what, what kind of job did you take after giving up the ministry? When I left the ministry, I became a computer programmer, which was amazingly lucky for me. I took one class, and before I even finished that one class, I was hired as a sort of beginning level. I loved it so much. I just learning curved up. And uh, for two years, or two and a half years, I was a programmer and an analyst working for the railroads, which I thought was a blast. So I was lucky. And some of the others aren't that lucky. But uh, that gave me a chance then to transition, and then I went to work for the Freedom from Religion Foundation in uh, 1987. And was there a time when you were still preaching, when you still, uh, when you didn't believe anymore, but you were still preaching what you knew people wanted to hear? After I became an atheist, I kept preaching for about four or five months, from the summer of 83 up until December, and I hated it. I knew it was wrong, I knew it was hypocritical, it was kind of interesting that I did that because there was no difference in the audience. In fact, a woman came up to me after one sermon and said, Reverend Barker, the Spirit of God was on your ministry. And I'm thinking, it was? Because I didn't feel it, but she was feeling it. So, um, and I had to stop. I, I couldn't keep going. And in December of 83, I said, enough's enough. Uh, especially when I realized there was an atheist in that audience. And here I was being a phony, not just to other believers, but to another atheist. So. Uh, and, and in the clergy project, <clears throat> we don't fault those clergy who are still in the ministry. We understand. We're sympathetic because we went through it too. I know there are some atheists who say, well, quit being a phony. Just get out right now. Well, we could do that, but the, 
the ethical consequences of that can be drastic. It's kind of like if you know your marriage is ended, do you just walk out right now? Or is there a period of time when you are phonies for a while? It's a bad marriage, but you're having to work out the details. So, especially if you have children, yeah. And so, it's a similar thing. The marriage is over, and I'm going to have to get out. But I've got to do this in some kind of. I have to stay on my feet in some way. Others became uh, philosophy professors, which is a good fit. Uh, a large number of former clergy go into social work, which is also a good fit. Uh, Tom Reed in Madison, Wisconsin, a Mississippi Roman Catholic priest, went into social work because he went into the priesthood to help people, and that's the same reason he went out. He really wanted to help people. Some of them sell insurance, some of them start their own business, some of them just get a job. Uh, I just met a fellow a, a few days ago who said he was a pastor. He's now grinding coffee. And, um, and I said, well, I think that's a higher calling. <laughs> so the clergy project is not holding anybody's hands. We all have to figure out our own lives. And nobody wants our hands held. But it can be really affirming to know that others have gone through it and have, and have turned out okay. Within just the last few years, as I began to truly realize where I was at, I was, I was faced then with this dilemma of committing what I call identity suicide because now I realized who everyone thought I was, I wasn't. And so what do I do? Do I pretend to be that person for the sake of the mortgage? Do I pretend to be that person for the sake of my community, for all the people that I love? What's it going to do to all those people that I've been ministering to all these years when suddenly their leader says something different? And so it, it, was, it was a horrible process. It was a, a, an extremely horrible process. But thanks to the Clergy Project, which is sponsored by the Dawkins Foundation, which is ran by Dan Barker from Freedom From Religion, uh, the Clergy Project began to uh, connect me over the internet with ministers who also had lost their belief in the supernatural but were also trapped in the ministry and it gave me the encouragement and it gave me some insights and I realized that my situation though it was desperate wasn't impossible and that I might do more than survive identity suicide I might actually thrive through it so I came out I came out uh, on Facebook in October of last year about 165 days ago now your, your life almost seems very similar to when you were a traveling preacher now. I mean, yeah. are you an evangelical a atheist now? Yeah, I guess I am an evangelical atheist. And evangelism in the original Greek just means the good news. So an angel is just the word messenger. So the, the motivation that took me out of the pulpit was the same motivation that put me in. And we're not all preachers, and it's probably good for the world that we're not all preacher types, but I'm the kind of person who wants to know what's true and stand up and speak what's true. So the pulpit for me was that way of speaking the truth. Then when I learned that Christianity is not true, I didn't change. I didn't become a different person. The, the conclusions changed, but I still want to stand up and speak what's truth. And, and that Oprah show was like, the beginning of, yeah, I could still do this. This is great. It's, and maybe, psychologically, there's something like a reverse penance going on. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm feeling like I have to undo the damage of those 19 years of preaching, and so, perhaps. I think, though, now with 20, what, 25 years now? I think I've more than undone the damage. But um, nothing wrong with speaking out. In fact, Christians would say, don't be ashamed to stand up and speak what you think is the truth. My parents told me that, and that's a great lesson I learned from my fundamentalist parents. Stand up and say it. Who cares if they slam the door in your face? Who cares if they call you a fool? The Bible says you will be persecuted and called fools, so that means you're doing the right thing. And so we at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, we have that attitude. If we're not getting persecuted, if we're not getting the hate mail, we're doing something wrong because we want to make a difference. We don't want to make people angry. But that's one of the ways we know that the message is having some kind of an impact. So uh, I guess evangelical atheist is a compliment. I guess I wonder, uh, as an atheist, there's some things that we don't know yet. Uh, science is hoping to find out. Do you ever yearn for that simpler uh, way that you had of, of your mind, of, of just feeling like you, you knew the truth and 
uh, was, was there was there a certain times when you look back and say, "Wow, that was a, that was actually kind of I was very happy," you know, in that belief. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, and it's similar to to remembering how peaceful and happy I was waiting for Santa Claus. That was a great time of life. I can't go back and will never go back and shouldn't go back because we develop, right? But I can look back and smile. That was a fun time being four years old and, and Santa was real and you know, I'm not knocking it because that's where I was then as a four year old. Uh, and maybe there's a little twinge of nostalgia for our childhood. And I know Richard Dawkins has written that he thinks that little twinge for a return to the securities of childhood is part of the motivation behind faith because we have the sort of, as, as a species, we're slow developers compared to other species. And so there's a yearning for that time when mommy and daddy would tell you what to do, when everything was simple, and then you could just get your orders from mommy and daddy, and life was like that. So yeah, there's some kind of a psychological yearning, but intellectually there's no desire. Intellectually, most atheists find peace and humility knowing that we don't know. That's a totally different thing. It's okay not to know. In fact, not knowing is what drives science. If we had all the answers, there'd be no science. We would just look everything up in a table somewhere, right? So it's the quest. It's the, it's the admission of ignorance. It's the acknowledgement of humility in the face of this big, wide, vast, who knows how big our ignorance is. Uh, that's exciting and peaceful at the same time because then we can stop pretending. We can stop imagining that it's all about me. I've been called by these spiritual powers to become this great cosmic leader, evangelist. You know, uh, you, you, you get knocked down a few notches and I realize I'm just this biological organism. I'm an animal in a natural environment and that's enough. Do you remember when you found out that there wasn't a Santa Claus? Santa Claus? Yeah, I, I remember, yeah. Well, what was your reaction? It was kind of disappointing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you feel like your parents had lied to you? Or? You know, I didn't, I didn't worry. I, I don't know. I didn't worry about it too much. <laughs> but uh, I know some kids have thought. Traumatic. Yeah, it was a little traumatic, yeah. And I, uh, one uh, friend of mine, his, their son asked when he was little, he said, is Santa Claus real like Jesus is real? Oh. Very thoughtful question. Yeah. Very good question. When I was a child, I thought of childish things. Eternal life in paradise with angel wings. A father up in heaven who would hover over me and tell me what to think, tell me what to be. But now that I have grown, it's time to use my own good mind. I'm out of here. If the only way you can accept a claim is by faith, then you're admitting that that claim cannot be accepted on its own merits. There's something weak about the claim. Because if the claim is substantiated with evidence and scholarly consensus and so on, then you don't invoke faith. We don't use faith for things that we are sure of. We only use faith for things that we are ignorant of. In fact, the word believe is often an expression of doubt. What time is it? It's 1.30, I believe. We, we use believe and faith for uncertainty and somehow in the religious scheme that gets flipped upside down and being uncertain is a virtue. So faith really is, it really is a cop-out. It's a way of saying, I'd like to believe this is true and I, I don't have any good reason on its own, so I'm going to, it's going to be true by faith. And isn't that great, by faith? It's almost wishful so, thinking. It is. And if you think about it at all, if faith is a valid tool of knowledge, if it is, then anything goes. Anything can be true by faith. As a Christian apologist, I would have said, well, not anything can be true. It has to be logically coherent. But then there has to be enough evidence. There has to be a certain threshold of evidence from which we can make a leap of faith. And I used to think the resurrection story, the empty tomb, was enough. It wasn't proof, but it was enough evidence to say, aha, we're going to make a leap of faith beyond that. But that's not how historians work, honest historians. Honest historians would say, if there's a 10% likelihood of the resurrection stories being true, then there's a 90% likelihood that they're not. You don't make this leap of faith. You go with the probabilities. And if you have to round it off, 
a 10% likelihood means you would round it off to zero if you have to round it off. So that's intellectual honesty that cuts across the grain of what we would like to be true because we want to feel special. We want life after death. We want a father figure giving us peace and love and moral direction. And we think that if we don't have that, our lives would fall apart. So that's why faith is a cop-out. It's the cheap, lazy way to arrive at what you think is true. Well, and I guess that is pretty much the central tenet of Christianity is the resurrection, Jesus rising from the dead. Um, what, what do you think? Is there a possibility that this did actually happen? We do know that there is an immense propensity among human beings today and in the past and even admittedly in the New Testament itself this propensity to exaggerate, to interpolate, to create myths, to tell lies. For example, in the New Testament, Paul warns the readers, be aware of those Christians who are <clears throat> pretending to write letters as if they were from me. Paul admitted that early Christians were in the habit of lying and producing forgeries. Bart Ehrman brings that point out in his new book, Forged. So even in the very beginning, we know from the beginning of Christian history all the way till today, there has been this immense temptation to exaggerate or to create myths out of, out of nothing. So that doesn't disprove the resurrection, but when you consider that possibility, that high likelihood that human beings are doing that, against the possibility that there actually was a dead person th for three days who then came out of the grave, and the sun was darkened for three hours during the middle of the day, during a time when there could not have been an eclipse of the sun because the moon was a full moon. And when you consider all these possibilities, and you say, yeah. Saints rising from the dead and walking yeah, in the grave and the, walking through the city. And when you say, okay, all of those things could have happened. The mistake a lot of people make is to replace it could have happened with it did happen. Because if this 10%, let's say, most of us would put it down to maybe 1%, but whatever it is, it could have happened. No atheist can disprove the resurrection. Maybe there's some weird thing we don't know. But just to say that something fits and could have happened is not to say that it did. To be honest, you have to factor in everything else we know about history, about people exaggerating. Mistakes could be a simple mistake. It uh, could be a misinterpretation. We have to factor all of that into our balanced equation. And when we have to say... Did Jesus actually rise from the dead? Well, maybe he could have. But to say that is to say it's much more likely that he didn't for all these known reasons we have. Uh, all of our background knowledge, let's say, about what we know could or couldn't happen. So nobody's saying any historical truth is 0% or 100%. But the resurrection of Jesus is such a low probability that for all practical purposes we can round it off to zero and say no, that that didn't happen. We even know the stories themselves were elaborated. The stories themselves in the New Testament started out simple, but as time passed, a later gospel writer would make it a little more amazing, and then 15 years later, Matthew and Luke come along and make it even more amazing. And then when you get to John, 60 years later, whoa, this is incredible. So you can actually see a legendary growth in history as the story is being told. When you factor that into this, and you unpack it all, you realize that the evidence we really do have for the resurrection is so slim. What it amounts to is a story. A story could be true, but all we've got is a story. Well, and it's not even a completely original story. When you look at all of the, I know in high school that was kind of one of the things that started me thinking was, wow, look at all of these other religions that had very similar stories of bringing people back to life from the dead yeah. or Ganesh being brought back to yeah. life with a miracle and even turning water into wine. You know, the Greeks had these miracles yeah. of their gods and yeah. so that even looked uh, almost like negative evidence, you know, yeah. the fact that they might be borrowing these from earlier yeah. religions. Dionysus was a god-man who died, who had an empty tomb, who turned water into wine and so on. So. Uh, in addition to all those reasons why we might doubt the likelihood of the story, there's the pagan parallels that preceded that, that make it seem as if the Jesus story were cut from the same fabric as other ancient stories. And there's also the internal contradictions within the story. The gospel writers themselves 
the, the worst example anyone could ever come up with to prove the reliability of the Bible is the resurrection. It's given five times, at least, five times in, this, in the Bible. And in the New Testament, they don't agree with each other. They contradict each other on so many points. And in my book, Godless, I give 17 of those contradictions about what... Even fundamentalist scholars have to throw up their hands and say, whoa, there's something's wrong here. Something's got to give, because they cannot all have been right. So all of the legendary growth, what we know, our background knowledge of what we know about human nature, the pagan parallels that make it look like the resurrection came from earlier beliefs, and the internal contradictions vastly drop the probabilities that the resurrection really happened. Josephus wrote his Antiquities of the Jews after the year 90, which was at least 60 years after the supposed event. <coughs> and that little paragraph about Jesus appears in this most unlikely place. It doesn't flow, for one thing, so it looks like it was just stuck in. And that little paragraph about Josephus, uh, that little paragraph about Jesus in Josephus actually doesn't show up until the fourth century. There's no evidence that anyone ever knew about or quoted that. At the time of Eusebius, who some scholars call the, the most thoroughly dishonest historian of antiquity, Eusebius suddenly tells us, oh, by the way, in the works of Josephus, there's a paragraph about Jesus. The wording is from a later time. The way it's phrased is strange. Josephus was a believing Messianic Jew, so if Jesus had been the fulfillment of prophecy, as he says there, he would have devoted more than a couple sentences to him in his entire opus, you know. He didn't, he didn't tell us what prophecies he was the ful fulfillment of, and Josephus could have, he was smart enough, and, uh, and on and on. Even, even most fundamental scholars admit that that little paragraph, that the only thing from the first century outside the Bible that might corroborate Jesus that little paragraph was probably entirely interpolated or it was edited from an earlier, simpler thing. So uh, you're right, where do you draw the line? Yeah. And so it's perfectly consistent with what we know about history to imagine that that was just stuck in later. We know that happened in the church. The Catholic Church invented the, uh, that verse about the Trinity. They just stuck it into the Latin Vulgate out of thin air. They tampered with the scriptures. So. Since Christians have exhibited historically this tendency to tamper with their documents, to change them, uh, it's consistent to imagine that that could have happened also with Josephus. You can't prove it either way, but it's very flimsy evidence for Jesus. I want to thank the FFRF and everyone here because this community has been more amazing to me than I could have ever imagined or asked for. Uh, they supported me when really no one else was. I have support from other organizations, of course, but when all the hate started rolling in, um, the FFRF was one of the best people or organizations in my life, and um, they've helped me tremendously. They've made me feel accepted where I felt hated before, and they've brought me into this community in such a big way, and that means everything to me because it's changed my life. What is the Freedom From Religion Foundation? What, what do you do there? The Freedom From Religion Foundation is a national organization of freethinkers, atheists and agnostics mainly, although we're open to anybody who supports our purposes, which are number one, to keep religion and government separate, and number two, to educate the public about the views of non-believers. So we concentrate mostly on the first purpose of state church separation, although we also do a lot of the educational. and. Um, we do it through legal action, through letters, through lawsuits, through educational activities. We've always had a number of lawsuits in the courts. Right now, we have 10 that are going, federal to state lawsuits, uh, state level lawsuits, challenging uh, everything from um, the National Day of Prayer to the parsonage exclusion for taxes for clergy. Uh, nativity scenes on public property, a Christian cross on top of a water tower in a city, a Jesus monument in Montana, um, high school credit being given to uh, off-campus religious education. Um, and over the years, we've had more than 50 lawsuits. We started in the 1970s. 1978 became a national organization, uh, nonprofit. We just hired our fourth full-time attorney which is pretty amazing growth for us in the last 
seven or eight years, the, the growth of our group, the growth of all the groups, I think, in America is just really steep right now. So we're over 18,000, about 18,500 members. We have uh, 13 full-time staff, and we're outgrowing our building. And uh, it's everything from working on a lawsuit, which is really fun, uh, to um, national media and publishing books in our newspaper, in our national weekly radio show, Free Thought Radio, uh, public speaking, debates, and... Um, and most of the people uh, that I interviewed in my town, they pretty much say that you're being working for the devil and that uh, you know you're you know what you're doing is against God and that you're against Christians and that you are trying to uh, oppress them and destroy the country and uh, I, I imagine there must be some mm -hmm. you must get some hate mail there must be some people who aren't too happy with with what you're doing we do get a lot of hate mail in fact we often publish a page of what we call crank mail which some of our readers love and some of them hate you know but the crank mail from believers in fact, there's a young woman who actually reads it on YouTube. She reads the entire FFRF crank mail. And some of it we can't even say. I mean, some of it's horrible. We know that this doesn't represent all Christians. We know that. It's just the, the cranks in the religion. But it does show you the, the hatred and the insecurity among a lot of believers when you're doing something against what they think is precious that they have to resort to ad hominem. I even had a debate opponent once say I was demon-possessed. Maybe because I was doing such a good job, you know, so I took it as a compliment. So when they say we're working for the devil, we're not because there's no devil. We take it as a sign of success. We are being noticed. They're, they are upset with the fact that their precious views are being challenged. So um, about a month ago, in fact, the day before the Reason Rally, we got an envelope in the mail. Our staff member opened it. It was human feces sent from somebody who read our New York Times full page ad about asking liberal Catholics to leave the church. And uh, the, um, the police came into the office to get Mel's fingerprints for the envelope so they could find out, because there's some kind of a federal crime to do that. It's probably a hate crime and all of that. And after doing that, the police officer joined the foundation, thinking, this is a great group. I like what you guys are doing. So um, uh, we had a dead fish in the mail once. We get an awful lot of phone calls. And some of them are death threats. and. Even though we might, want to, we might not want to take them as seriously because we know they're just people blowing off, they're mad. The police have told us they want to be informed of any threat like that. So we have to report, a number of times every year, we have to report that there's threats coming in. And um, we know there's a risk, but any group that's advocating for any cause is going to have enemies. So it's not like... But it does seem that uh, atheists... Uh are, are, are among the most hated. Why do you think atheists are so hated? I mean, if it's somebody from a different religion, they obviously don't believe what you believe is true. Why are atheists more than anybody else so universally despised, it seems? Yeah, when I was a preacher, I used to feel ambivalent about Muslims, let's say. They're totally wrong and they're not going to heaven, but at least they believe in God. So there's some hope for them. Maybe we, they believe in God and we could switch them to the right God, right? So there's, there's at least that. Jews are wrong, but they believe in God of the Bible, so we could convert Jews, you know? There's that attitude. But atheists, there's no hope. An atheist doesn't believe in God, and so what the atheist is saying is that my hope for eternal life is wrong. Atheists are telling me as a believer that I'm not going to see Grandma in heaven someday. I love grandma and I want to see grandma. And they're telling me that my hope to see her is, is incorrect and stupid and wrong. So atheism sort of cuts at the core of the conservative believers. It cuts them so deeply of who they are and what they hope for, what their life's all about, that we must be extreme evil, devil worshiper, Satan. You know, I mean, they, in their minds, we must be the possible worst of the worst. And you see that in society right now. Atheists are still at the bottom of the totem pole about who you would trust, for example, uh, to be president of the United States. So, Well, and I find uh, that uh, even people who aren't that upset that I'm an atheist, their question is, well, that's fine, but if you have kids, you surely you're going to bring them up in a religion at least. And I think it's that, uh, that unspoken thing that you can't have morals. Uh, if you're an atheist, if you don't believe in God. And I, I think that may also contribute to why people 
Uh, I know some of the people, because I am one of the few out uh, atheists in the, in the art world, I'm always having other artists come up to me and, and say, uh, very well-known artists, oh, I'm an atheist too, you know, but I can't say, you know, and, uh, but then I have other people who are Christian who are so shocked and they say, I can't believe you're an atheist. Um, you're so moral though, and so you do all this charity work and things. So I think it's that, it's yeah. showing that they think that you can't have morals if you're, if you're an atheist. Well, and doesn't your inspiration for your art come from on high? You hear that sometimes, you know, aren't you inspired by something outside of yourself, you know? Oh yeah, and people uh, will say, all the great art in history was done by, by Christian artists. And I, of course, always come back, well, how do you know? I mean, through most of history, if they were really, uh, didn't believe, they would be put to the, put to death or they would not get any commissions, you know, from the church or, yeah. I mean, there's probably been a lot of doubters that we, we have no idea that they were. Yeah. So. Well, and, and I'll have to check my facts on this, but I think there were a lot of painters. I think Turner was a non-believer and, um, and others, but I, I do know in the field of music, an awful lot of atheists and agnostics have been involved, even writing religious music. Rafe Vaughn Williams was an atheist, and he wrote hymns in the English hymnal. Right. And he said, well, if you got to go to church, you may as well listen to good music, you know. So uh, a lot of the music was commissioned. If you're going to make a living back then, you, you write for who's paying, and it was either the king or the nobility or the church. They were the ones paying for the music. So there was an awful lot of religious music written more for the stomach than for, than for the spirit. So it was, um, and we know that. Even Handel's Messiah was recycled secular melodies. A lot of it was. And uh, uh, three requiems, three requiems based on the Bible. Brahms and Berlioz and Verdi each wrote these requiems. None of them were believers. They were using the Bible as a text, just as they would use pagan sources as a text or any other source. And Brahms admitted, you know, there's some parts of the Bible I'm not going to use. I won't go that far. But he, he wrote his requiem based on, you know, because what are you going to do? You're going to write a Christian requiem and you're going to use the Bible. That doesn't mean they were inspired by God. It doesn't mean they were writing religious music for religious purposes. They were writing human music. I guess the, the question about uh, bringing up my children, too. We don't have children, but I guess you'd be the perfect test case because you brought up children as Christians and you, you have another daughter that you brought up as an not as an atheist, but in an atheist household, I guess you didn't bring yeah. her to church. Um, did she come out much less moral mm -hmm. than the others? Or Sabrina, our daughter, is a fourth generation atheist. And when we say we brought her up as an atheist, that doesn't mean that we indoctrinated her. We didn't have Sunday morning memorize Bertrand Russell, you know, and that kind of stuff. Like she had to pass some creed or something. She was just free to be herself and. Uh, indirectly, she heard our views, and she was free to make up her own mind. And she's a very strong free thinker, and we're happy. We're happy when our daughter wins an argument against us. That means there's hope for the future. That we don't have to, we don't have to be right about everything. You can learn from your children. And so, um, I think most Christian families who raise their children in the church, what they're really doing, they're not giving them religious moral training. They're just giving them human moral training. These human values transcend all the religions. That's why Muslim families can raise good children. That's why Jewish and Christian and Buddhist and Hindu families can raise good children. Because the values they're tapping into, they're not religious values at all. They're this common sort of transcendent human value that, in fact, it's the same values by which we judge a religion in the first place to be good or bad. You don't use the the framework within the religion to say, oh, that's a good religion. We're using a, an overview, human value, human nature. Are we kind to other human beings? Do we value peace? Do we want love? Do we want cooperation? Do we want less violence in the world? Those are the things we use. And so I think 95% of Christian families who are raising good kids are doing them on humanistic principles because the Bible doesn't have much of that at all. In fact, the Bible is a very bad moral guide. There's a couple good things in the Bible. And Thomas Jefferson admitted, he took a pair of scissors, and Thomas Jefferson said, yeah, there are some good teachings in the Bible, but it's like, and these are his words, it's like digging through a dunghill to find a diamond. And he found some diamonds, and I think a lot of Christians, they just pick out the diamonds from the Bible, which are there, 
And then they say that's, that's the Christian scheme, when really those diamonds are human values. So our daughter Sabrina is a human being, and you know we didn't stop her from going to church with her friends. We didn't stop her from reading the Bible. We didn't say, you can't do this. Use your own mind. And she, like most good Christian, Jewish, Muslim kids, has grown up as a well-rounded human being. Caring as a man, I'm your neighborhood atheist. Moral as can be, your friendly resident secular humanist. I'm not afraid of hell. Is it really that David Barton is creating these beliefs or is it that they want to believe something and so they're going to make somebody like him famous who's willing to create the lies for them? Yeah, I remember that feeling as a preacher to only read and trust the books written by people who agree with my theology because I was in the business of promoting my theology to the world, as a lot of conservative Christians are. They're in that business of promoting it. So what you want is everything that supports and confirms and helps you win your arguments. So some book that's critical isn't going to help you. But a book like David Barton, in a book that says these things, it does help your argument. And even if it turns out to be untruthful, Paul said something like that in the New Testament, even if my lie helps to bring people into Christ, that's more important. And if it turns out that it's not exactly right, well, it doesn't matter because if we can get people to believe and follow us, that's what's most important. And those details don't matter as much. So I, I actually know there are some atheists that are the same way. There's something in human nature. I've talked to atheists who have looked at some of my debates, you know, that I've done that are online. And they said, they listen to my statements and then they fast forward through everything the other person says and they just want to get to the stuff that I said. Which I guess it's kind of economical, but that's also unfair. We should listen to all sides. We should be open to, to let's hear what the people say who we agree with, but let's also hear the, the disagreement. Otherwise, how was anyone ever going to learn anything? There's this tendency that we have in our brains, no matter who we are, to cheerlead for what we, for our own pet theories, and that's dangerous. It's kind of, yeah, that confirmation bias, and uh, it also kind of seems to stem from what you had mentioned in your book about that it's your starting point and a lot of Christians' starting point is God. That that is yeah. true, that that exists, the Bible is true, and then everything else follows from that first assumption. So, yeah. um, I guess you're right. But, but now, what I say and what we say at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, if it's not true, why believe it? The most important question that should be asked of any religion is, is it true? When I was in Pennsylvania last week, we were doing a march for atheism, and a Christian man came up to me, almost with tears in his eyes, and he's saying, you were a preacher? Can, can you tell me? I mean, can you just tell me what went wrong? Just can you summarize it? And I said, yes. I learned that Christianity is not true true. And if something's not true, I'm going to stop preaching it. Does that make sense to you? And he looked at me and he said, well, that's honest. Okay, thank you. And then he walked away. So instead of spending two hours arguing all the facts, just, if it's not true, stop believing it. That's hard for people to do because that means they have to give up so much of what they think they are as people and their hope for the future. So. Well, and, and what I took away from a lot of the talks at the Reason Rally and, and from your book is that you're not necessarily trying to tell people uh, what they should or shouldn't believe. You're trying to teach them how to use reason and how to think and evaluate on their own and then they'll come to those conclusions. That's exactly right. We atheists are not committed a priori to some truth that there is no God. That's not a doctrine, that's not a dogma. We are committed to reason. And I will admit that I would go back to believing in God if there's good reason for it. If there is a God, that would be an amazing thing to know. I would want to know that. 
I would have a thousand questions to ask of this God. I might even ask it to apologize, you know. But still, if there's a God, that's, that would be a fact of reality that we should all want to know. So we're not closed-minded. We don't have our heads stuck in the sand like, no, I don't want any moral restrictions on my life, so I'm going to refuse to believe in this God who tells me that I can't be gay or that I can't do this, you know. So um, you're absolutely right. Most of us atheists are not so much preaching atheism. We say it's a conclusion we have, but what we are preaching is reason and human morality as opposed to uh, absolutistic authoritarian morality, a morality that lets us think about the situations. And we think there's so much more progress to be made, so much more to be learned with that attitude than, than blind faith. Whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or a skeptic or a rationalist or whatever you like to call yourself, we all disbelieve in the same gods. I think coming out as a free thinker is one of the most revolutionary acts of an unbeliever today. It is time to tell it like it is about religion. The emperor has no clothes. What is in your mind the difference between an atheist and an agnostic? I think on that question George Smith sums it up really nicely in his book Atheism the Case Against God. You can be both. Almost all agnostics are atheists. You can be atheist and agnostic. It, atheism is not some middle ground between belief and non-belief. Agnosticism, a lot of people use it as a kind of handy, I, I'm just not going to decide now. But actually agnosticism addresses what you know or you claim you can know. It's a knowledge question. Atheism and theism are not a knowledge question. Atheism and theism are a belief question. It addresses what you believe or you think you should believe. So y you can be and should be both. In fact, there are some agnostics who are theists, like Pascal. Pascal, the philosopher and mathematician, said we can't know and maybe we won't ever know and I don't know if my Roman Catholic beliefs are true, but I'm going to choose to believe, you know, Pascal's wager. I'm going to believe anyway. So that's honest. He's saying, I'm an agnostic, but I'm believing. Most agnostics, like me, say, I'm an agnostic, I don't know, but I'm not believing. Atheism isn't a knowledge claim, it's just an absence of a belief. There are some atheists who are more than lowercase a atheists, they are capital A atheists, who might say, I know there's no God, or I believe there's no God, but that's a tiny subset. And I fall into that subset if God is defined as the God of the Bible. If the God of the Bible is the God we're talking about, then I'm a capital A atheist. I know that God doesn't exist because it can't exist. In the same way that a married bachelor cannot exist. It just can't. It's, it's, it's a silly question. But that doesn't mean any one of the other 80 billion definitions of God, you know, I mean, we, sh we should be open. We should always be open to all these possibilities. So, um, Well, and Pascal's wager seems... Uh, a, a strange thing to say, I, I am choosing to believe because of the consequences. Do you really believe then? I mean, yeah. can you talk yourself into something because, yeah. uh, because, uh, because it's like, you know, uh, uh, you're afraid of what might happen if you don't believe. Are you really yeah. believing that? I don't know. Yeah, some people think belief is not a choice. It's, it's just not a choice. S historians would say we have an 80% probability that this is true. So we're gonna, it's going to be our belief that this is true, but that's not a choice. It's an 80% probability. It's, if it were 30%, you wouldn't choose. You would just admit, oh, the likelihood is so low. So I know a lot of atheists who say belief is impossible. How could you believe, choose to believe something when, um, when there's a lack of evidence or, or no reason for that? So, um, yeah, In my first film, I have a whole series. I could have put in uh, 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 probably 50 more but I just put in maybe 20 who all were saying, I'm 100% certain, I'm 100% yeah. certain, 100% certain. Yeah. And that was rather uh, amazing. Yeah. Whereas most of us atheists and skeptics and liberals would say, the likelihood is so high. My confidence is 90 to 95%. I might be wrong, but I'm going to round it off. So that's the kind of confidence we talk about in science and in history is that we're pretty comfortable. In fact, all truth is that way. There's no 100% truth claim or 0% truth claim ever, except for logically impossible. Married bachelors, let's say. But um, 
pa with Pascal, when you think about Pascal's wager, it just boils down to an argument from intimidation. Because what if I'm wrong, I'm going to hurt. What if I'm wrong, I'm going to burn. What if there is a hell and a heaven? What have you got to lose? I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to wager to be safe. Well, that just boils down to a threat, really. With that kind of thinking, you should pick the religion that has the worst hell in it. Because that's what you have the most to lose from. Christians should become Muslims if they're going to respect that kind of reasoning. Because the Muslim hell is worse than the Christian hell. What if the Christians are wrong and they're going to actually end up in the Muslim hell? Of course, they don't reason like that. And I don't even think Pascal was reasoning like that. He was just making this bet. So, <clears throat> I, I kind of think that, what if you're wrong? If there is a hell and I turn out to be wrong, well, then I'll go there. I'll go there with some integrity. And I think I would rather spend an eternity in hell suffering these torment than pretending to worship this God who created a hell. That would be more of a hell in my thinking to bow down like a slave before this creature that would create a torture chamber like that. Dan Barker! Let him hear it and Annie Laurie Gaylord! Um, yeah, I don't want to take too much time, but I got a couple of tweets that made my heart sore. I just got a tweet from Iran from Majid, who says, we wish we could all be there, and we wish for the day non-believers can be themselves here in Iran. We're here for you, brother. We are here for you. Just say no to religion. No more myth and superstition. Just say no. What are you going to say? Just say no.